it with say a spectroscopic binary star. I don't know if it's been done. It's, 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 it's more confusing. Uh, it's definitely more difficult because um, you're looking for tiny, tiny signals. Um, so, yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. So when we have a system with multiple planets, usually what we've done is we've fit the big wobble and then we remove that and say we, we discovered a planet. Then we remove that wobble from the signal and then we see another smaller wobble and then we remove that one. And then, oh, look, there's another periodic signal we see. And so you just keep working downwards um, until you find, uh, you know, you can't pick anything else out from the noise. Okay, this is a less than perfect device. Come on. So anyway, if the, the, our um, modeling shows us that if we properly do an adaptive secondary uh, mirror and use adaptive optics on the APF, you can get nearly three times as much light through that slit, which means you can either look at three times more stars in a night or look at stuff that's three times fainter. Um, so it's like transforming our one APF telescope into two or maybe even three APF telescopes. So huge advantage. So this is um, what's in progress. I'm not quite sure if we have a date. I think we're still trying to raise money to uh, finish this project, but uh, it's well underway and very exciting if it does get uh, implemented. Um, speaking of planets, we're moving back to planets in our own solar system with one of our newest telescopes, PEAS. That's Planet as Exoplanet Analog Spectrograph. It's a mouthful. This is a half meter plane wave telescope. So if you have enough money, you could buy one of these yourself. They're actually fabulous little telescopes. Um, this was put together with all off the shelf parts by a postdoc at uh, UC Santa Cruz named Emily Martin. And um, we have this problem. Planets in our solar system, we can see in great detail. Planets in other solar systems around other stars, we can't see in detail. So this telescope has an instrument that is designed to scramble the light from say Jupiter to make it sort of look more like an exoplanet around another star so that we can start figuring out what we might be seeing with spectrographs that can actually look at the atmospheres of planets around other stars. Now the James Webb Space Telescope, you might've noticed in just the past few days has had press releases about planets with no atmospheres and planets that might have you know, other important elements like water or carbon dioxide in their atmospheres. Um, but this is gonna help us by studying planets in our own solar system as if they were planets in another solar system and see what information we can extract as we get these new and better um, instruments. Now, the P's, essentially, it, it does two things. The light comes through the telescope, goes to an instrument, and then they split off some of the light to just take regular old pictures, like all of us are familiar with. And then the other half of the light goes to what's called an integrating sphere. So this takes all the light and essentially scrambles it um, and then spits it out into a spectrograph so we can look at the spectrum. Um, in November of 2020, it finally saw first light. It was a bitterly cold night. Oh, so this is Emily Martin and Andy Schemer with their first light information, but they took a spectra of Mars. So the spectrum actually goes into many, many fiber optics. So each one of these lines, horizontal lines on Mars is a separate spectrum from each fiber optic. Um, and then the sky background. So they said, yeah, they were really looking at Mars. Anyway, this telescope does not have its own dome. It lives in the basement of the 120 inch telescope. It's on a cart and we roll it out. Our undergraduate students roll it out, take their data. Um, and so if this is a regular program, we hope eventually it will have its own dome um, and be remotely operable. So the students don't need to come up to the observatory, but for the time being, they get a nice scenic trip to uh, Mount Hamilton. So now that we've talked about planets in our solar system, outside of our solar system, what might be on those planets? There might be life. 
So we have another instrument called Panosetti. Uh, that stands for pulsed, all sky, near infrared, optical, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, quite a long title. Uh, but this is a program that actually started at our nickel telescope with an optical SETI program looking for laser pulses in the optical from other civilizations that might be out there. Now, we've looked for radio signals for a long time. We've only been looking for optical signals on the order of mm, 20, 25 years. Um, haven't discovered anything yet, but we keep expanding the technology and the technology keeps getting better. Um, so now... In the, this dome used to house the Carnegie Dual Astrograph. That telescope was retired a couple decades ago from use. And uh, we just put the two, excuse me, the two Panosetti telescopes here at the bottom of the slit. Um, so these are two, I don't know, 12-inch telescopes with Fresnel lenses on the front. So they have wide fields of view. And these telescopes don't move. They just look at the sky as it drifts overhead. Um, and uh, these new technology called multi-pixel photon counters are sensitive all the way from the near ultraviolet at 300 nanometer wavelength, all the way through the optical into the near infrared to uh, the 1650 nanometer wavelengths. So there are a lot of different laser technologies out there that lays at very different wavelengths. And this system has a good chance of detecting pretty much anything at the laser wavelengths that we're familiar with uh, using regularly. And so it's searching for these very short transient signals. Um, in fact, I'm very excited about this project because um, it shows we're sensitive. Oh, part of the plot is not showing here. Interesting. There's supposed to be a big gray box on the left-hand half of the... Oh, of the screen. So I'm not quite sure what's weird with the display here uh, that you can't see it all. But um, things in our universe are often variable and change brightness over time. And over long time scales, you know, minutes, hours, days, years, we have a lot of technology that's sensitive to it. When we start looking at things that change over time scales of nanoseconds to, you know, Tenth of a second, there's not a lot of technology that detects it. These multi pixel photon counters that Shelly Wright from UC San Diego is using in her Panoceti instrument can detect nanosecond pulses. So if you're using a super fast pulse laser, her instrument will see it. Um, and you know, so, so we're not, not just hoping to see lasers, but there are other astrophysical phenomena down here that run super fast and might be pretty bright that we may never have noticed before that her telescope will detect. So we have every chance of discovering new astrophysical phenomena as well as extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, you know, pulsars can you know change brightness pretty quickly, you know, up to a thousand times a second. Um, but as I said, there's a lot of parameter space here where there's just nothing in this plot that no one's had an instrument sensitive to before. So we have that. So as well as having the chance of detecting lasers. Yeah. Conversely, are we sending out signals with say a pencil laser or some other type of laser to see if we get any response? We have not purposely sent signals out with lasers that I'm aware of. Now we certainly have lasers powerful enough that have sent signals out into space that could be detected by other civilizations. The laser we use for our laser guide star system with, you know, with our adaptive optic system on the Shane telescope, not quite bright enough really for, for extraterrestrial civilizations to detect, but you know, a, a laser that's you know, a kilowatt of power has potentially, could potentially be done. And we've shot lasers that powerful out into space many times for all sorts of different reasons. So, um, so yes, we, we are inadvertently sending signals out just like we have with radio waves and television signals and everything else. Um, so you know, if they're out there, they might detect us and we might detect them. Um, anyway, the thing is, is this instrument is so good at detecting short, bright things that it actually detects things like you know, particle events in our atmosphere that create you know, photons and such, you know, cosmic rays hitting the atmosphere that create little bright pieces of light. So one telescope 
creates a lot of confusing signals because you're like, well, did this come from our own atmosphere or did it come from space? So they have built our newest telescope on Mount Hamilton, another Panosetti. And a little tiny dome is about six, <laughs> six feet in diameter with another 12 inch telescope doing the same thing and connected them with a half mile long fiber optic. And so these telescopes look at the same spot in the sky. And if they see a signal, they can triangulate and determine if that signal came from our own atmosphere, which we're not really interested in, or from outer space. Um, so this is all a test program um, with these small test telescopes, because eventually, and we're looking to raise money to do this, we want to be build full arrays of telescopes that look at the whole sky all the time um, at two different sites at Lick's Observatory separated by about 0.5 or you know, 0.6, maybe even 0.7 miles, depending on what sites we can use um, to do an all sky search for extraterrestrial intelligence instead of just the ones, you know, swath the sky they can look with their stationary telescopes right now. So the next telescope I want to talk about at Lick Observatory is the nickel reflector. So this is a 40 inch diameter or one meter diameter telescope. Um, it's really a workhorse telescope and where we train a lot of our undergraduate students in how to do professional astronomy. Um, it has a direct imaging camera that takes beautiful pictures like this picture of the Trifid Nebula that I took many, many years ago now. Um, NeroSETI was the predecessor, the near infrared optical search for extraterrestrial intelligence is the predecessor to the PanoSETI that I just talked about. And then new last year and this year, we have two things. We have a wavefront sensor. Now, a wavefront sensor is that part of the adaptive optics that measures the turbulence. And then we have LAMAS, which is um, low latency adaptive mirror something. I've forgotten what it all stands for. Anyway, it's a new adaptive optic system for the Nickel Telescope. Um, so I'll just quickly mention what's going on there. Um, first, the wavefront sensor. As I said, the wavefront sensor is a gizmo that allows us to measure the turbulence. Um, so also in the past, in 2022, we put in a brand new guide camera. So on the right hand, or sorry, left hand image at the bottom, you can see our guide camera, brand spanking new, much more sensitive, works so much better than the old one. Um, and then we have a pickoff mirror that's hidden behind this lens above the, the camera uh, that sends light to the little red box there. That is the wavefront sensor camera. So it's very small. Um, and so what we're doing right now is when we're looking at the stars, we just you know put a mirror in, flops in the way, blocks light to the guide camera. So you can see the wavefront sensor pickoff mirror actually blocking our guide camera field to view in the right-hand image is that round circle um, and the black blob blocking some of that circle is the pickoff mirror that's sending light from a star to the wavefront sensor. Unfortunately, I couldn't get from, from Micah Van Kooten, the, the PI of this, a picture of the wavefront sensor image itself um, for this talk. But, uh, but she is, at the end of every night, measuring what the turbulence statistics are. So once we know the turbulence statistics, um, we can look at making better adaptive optic systems. But it's mostly just characterizing this. But it's new, fun hardware that we've installed at the observatory. Um, and, uh, and then we have um, LAMAS. And this is a project from Lawrence Livermore Labs that is going to put a fully functional adaptive optic system on the Nickel Telescope. Um, this is a test program. It's not going to be permanently installed. But instead of an optical laser like we use at the Shane telescope that's at 589 nanometers which is yellow um, it's going to use a uv laser so we won't be able to see it with our eyes and it's going to be super powerful it's a hundred watt laser so 10 times more powerful than what we use at the Shane. um but uh, it's going to be this is a system that's designed to work super super fast and to correct things, because right now adaptive optics really works best for fixing turbulence in the near infrared. It turns out that the shorter the wavelength of light, the more turbulence affects the light and it's harder to correct. So adaptive optic systems with you know, previous technology worked really well for correcting the turbulence that affects near infrared light and not, didn't do so well for optical light. This system is going to be optimized to do optical correction so that you could observe, say, green light and uh, uh, get nice images. Um, 
we're working on getting the laser installed, we hope by June. We'll see, I'm working on all the paperwork for Space Force and FAA to, so we are allowed to use this laser safely. Um, but yeah, you know, we'll get beautiful images. You can see here at the upper right, whoopsie, at the upper right, this is what a short exposure image looks like through the telescope, big blob, and then the simulations of how it will work with the new adaptive optics. So you get a nice point-like source there. Um, so as I said, lots of new technologies coming. So the last thing I'm gonna talk about is my own research, my own scientific research. So we're sort of getting off the planet and adaptive optics train, but getting back onto the Shane three meter telescope and using our other major instrument, the CAST spectrograph, um, which is a medium to medium resolution spectrograph. One of the most common things that are observed with it are supernova explosions. We have a robotic telescope at Lick Observatory called the CATE, Katzman Automatic Imaging Telescope that, uh, discovers supernovae, and now there are many robotic telescopes around the world that discover supernova explosions, and then we characterize them with the Shane telescope. So here's some data. This was the first data um, after we uh, reopened with the pandemic and figured out remote observing with the Shane um, from people's own houses since they couldn't go into their offices. Um, but we were looking at uh, supernova 2020 uh, JFO, um, which I believe is a type two supernova. Anyway, the line that's vertical is the supernova. And then all the horizontal lines is uh, noise from our atmosphere or city lights here in San Jose. Um, and of course, a lovely picture of our staff at Lick Observatory in front of the telescope that was taken right before the pandemic started. Um, anyway, the research I do is on quasars. And quasars are supermassive black holes at the centers of distant galaxies. And quasars are characterized by having a supermassive black hole and accretion disk around it. Um, then there's usually a big dusty torus. And sometimes they have jets coming out. Um, there's often diffuse gas further away that gets illuminated by the, the quasar core. Um, stuff gets super hot. Um, and uh, disrupted very close to the black hole as stuff gets spaghettified and stretched out. It generates a lot of heat, hence a lot of light. Um, there are a lot of things, complicated things going on in there. Anyway, depending on how you view this thing depends on what you see. Um, if you're viewing from, you know, say up here, so you can sort of look down into the core and accretion disk area, you get what are called often type one Seifert or type one AGN, active galactic nuclei. Um, if you look from the side, you know, through the, the dust torus can block stuff. So you get a different looking spectrum. Um, anyway, these were things were discovered in the 1950s um, in the radio. And when they looked at these radio sources, they looked like stars in the optical component. So they were called quasi-stellar objects or quasi-stellar radio sources. Um, we still call them QSOs today. Um, later on, it was discovered that they were black holes in the centers of galaxies. Um, and it turns out that the original quasars were all identified via radio sources, but there are a lot of quasars that don't have radio components. That's so we don't see radio emission from them. Um, so one of my research projects is to discover new quasars because they've been selected by optical surveys. Um, they've been selected by radio surveys, but it turns out there are these whoopsie um, quasars that are dust obscured. So they don't show in the optical with the same colors as the, the blue type one AGN. So this is the accretion disk in Taurus in, uh, the schematic here. And so blue type ones we know a lot of, uh, but these red and ones that have dust in their own galaxy or dust from galaxy mergers, we're not quite sure where the dust is coming from, that makes them look redder, um, can block the optical light. Um, and so we're trying to one, discover these red quasars and two, figure out, is this a phase of their evolution? What is the environment they're in? Um, well, how many, what, proportion of the population of quasars these are. Um, we're using a lot of different telescopes to figure this out. We start with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and we just picked uh, the data release stripe 82, uh, data release seven stripe 82, because it was a confined reasonable area that we knew we had data from radio telescopes and other telescopes 
that also covered the same area. Um, and it turns out the Sloan Digital Sky Survey uh, telescope is very effective at finding blue type one AGNs. It's really good at it. But uh, obscured sources, both type two, the ones that you're looking sort of side on with the torus, you know, of, of obscuring gas, and red type ones are missed. So they may be there, but not identified. They may be seen by Sloan, but not identified as quasars in their surveys. So we came up with a relatively unbiased way of figuring out where what objects were quasars from the WISE telescope. So this is an infrared telescope that was, uh, I forgot what year it was launched, but it's a 40 diameter telescope in space and it maps the whole sky over and over and over again. Um, and you know, it came up with a total of like 563 million sources in that survey, huge number of sources. Um, and if you look at the colors of the surface, so, so if you compare the light emitted at 3.4 micron wavelength and 4.6 micron wavelength versus um, the light emitted in 4.6 and 12 micron light, you can come up with a nice plot here that very effectively different areas are populated by different types of objects. And you can see Q QSO and CFIRS here are the sort of things we're looking for. And so we said, okay, if we look at things in this color regime, and so the black line is our border. So targets, um, the red circles are the targets we've actually observed. Um, but if we overlay it on the plot, no, maybe we'll get the next slide. There we go. Um, you can see that we we can, you know, we have very neatly identified quasars that have the the plot on the left now the the circles in red are the newly confirmed qso's that we discovered and the green ones are quasars that we're not 100 percent sure quasars yet that we think they are but we don't have a red shift for them we don't know how far away they are because unfortunately every once in a while you get things that confuse this like radio stars so that have radio emission, um, but are not quasars. So to get rid of the radio stars, we use Gaia. So Gaia is measuring the proper motions of like all the stars in our galaxy. Um, it also measures a bunch of other objects, but uh, objects that have proper motions that are measurable cannot be at cosmological distances like the quasars we're looking for. So if it has a, reason, a measurable proper motion, it's a star, we reject it from our sample. Um, a few stars are not moving significantly in Gaia. So you know we get the occasional radio star um, contaminating our sample of things we think are quasars. Um, so what I do with the cast spectrograph on the Shane telescope is I take spectra of each one of our mystery objects and measure the redshift. Um, so these are two samples. Um, you know, one at a redshift that's whoopsie, not too high. Ah, go back. Um, only a redshift of you know 0.167. Now, um, and then we have one that's a pretty high redshift at uh, 2.63. You know, the highest redshift object I've measured so far with the Shane is at a redshift of about 3.5. So high redshift. Um, and of course, now that we have all these things that are confirmed quasars based on their spectra and redshift, we now look at the radio surveys. There are two radio surveys we're using, the Very Large Array Sky Survey and the first survey, the faint images of the radio sky at 20 centimeters. Um, so a lot of our targets don't have radio emission. They're what called radio quiet. Some of them do, like this, this one here is uh, you have the radio core and then you have lobes at the other side. So this, this is a quasar, it actually has jets and the ends of the jets are very bright, making it what we call an FR2 type quasar. So as I said, we have dozens and dozens and dozens of newly discovered quasars. Um, and here, you know, we have various campaigns, you know, 2019, we started off with 66 potential quasars, um, got redshifts for all of them. One of them turned out to be a star. Um, 2021, we got another 34 quasar redshifts measured. Um, we have a couple, a few quasars that have featureless spectra. These are might be blazars, a special class of quasar that don't tend to have emission lines that are easy to measure. So it makes it very diff difficult to measure their redshifts, or they might be something else entirely. Um, 
And then, you know, we're continuing. Of course, 2020, you'll see there's a big break because we had not only the pandemic, but we had a huge wildfire come through Lick Observatory, do a lot of damage. So 2020 was a pretty bad year. But these plots show, you know, the black dots are our new quasars. Um, the upper the sort of magenta dots up here tend to be elliptical galaxies hosting quasar cores. The bottom magenta blob tends to be uh, spiral type galaxies. Um, anyway, if you look at the red shift and how bright they are, the red dots are a newly discovered quasar. And this is only the 2019 data. I have not updated these plots to include any of our more recent data, um, but we're continuing on. As like I said, every year we observe more. Um, this year, I've lost all my telescope time due to snow. It's been very frustrating. Um, we'll see. Let's hope winter is finally over. Yeah, this year was like the snowiest winter on Mount Hamilton I've ever experienced. Uh, it was something else, but it really has hampered our data collection uh, activities. Anyway, what do we do? We now have to figure out which one of these are reddened quasars due to dust in their own galaxy or dust from someplace else. And uh, some of our red quasars have very bad fits. We do modeling fits. So the top row is uh, for two different quasars. Our bad fit of the quasar modeled quasar spectrum to what we see. If we then use a more sophisticated uh, program called Gandalf, um, that we can model the actual host galaxy component and subtract that out, and we get a much better fix to the galaxy. And you can see in these, this E B minus V is how much reddening. So here it said the reddening was 0.4. That's a lot of reddening. That's a lot of dust getting in the way of the quasar. But then when we deredden it, you can see that the, the E B minus V is essentially zero. So that's great. That means that the galaxy itself, so all the obscuring dust was in the galaxy itself. Um, whether the dust came from something intrinsic in the galaxy with star formation or from a merging system, we don't yet know. Uh, we need to do some more research. But we've done this for like all of our quasars that had some significant reddening. Um, and most of them, the vast majority, it's the, the galaxy itself, the dust in the galaxy itself that is causing the reddening. Um, and of course, the other thing we're seeing is these red QSOs, once we deredden them, come up in this nice brightness and uh, magnitude, absolute magnitude relation is very, very tight. But you can see it doesn't work for the very brightest red QSOs. They don't fit very well on the rest of the line. So we're trying to figure out what's going on there because it seems like the very most reddened QSOs tend to, uh, at the, the, the bright end, um, something else is going on. And we don't know what that is yet, but I'm gonna guess it's probably there in merging galaxy systems. So there's extra dust um, and extra feeding of the black hole in this process. Um, you could do all sorts of statistics. One of the interesting things is particularly this right-hand plot is when we look at blue QSOs, you see a nice peak here at a redshift of around 0.3 in the sample we were using. But the red QSOs, one, we see none at all at a redshift less than 0.1 in our sample. And there's a peak at a higher redshift. And then when you get to the higher redshift ones, we see more of them, that the red QSOs actually dominate at the high redshifts. So this implies there's something with the evolution of quasars, that something is making them more common earlier in the universe and less common now. So like I said, lots of unknowns. We also have other statistics here with the brightness that the dust, of, there are two types of dust obscured quasars. So the type twos, which I haven't really talked about much other than, you know, saying where they are, but the red type ones. And it, find, it turns out that <clears throat> as you get to brighter quasars, more intrinsically bright quasars, they tend to be dominated by these dust obscured ones rather than the type twos. Um, and we also see that at redshift, higher redshifts, they already do, they dominate as well. So as I said, there's something going on in the evolution of these quasars. We're not quite sure what it is yet, uh, but the more data we get, the stronger these relationships appear to be. Um, so that there really is something we think real going on there. Um. 
And again, and we also looked at the radio emission. It turned out these red QSO are more likely to be radio loud than the other types of quasars. Um, and so we've been looking at these uh, quasars and we have four different sort of types of radio sources. Ones that we call faint, they're faint but compact. Uh, compact sources, which look essentially point source like. We have extended sources, and then we have the FR2 lights, which are sort of look like they have jets and you know bright lobes at the end of the the radio jets. And if we look at our blue versus red QSOs, the red QSOs tend to be much more likely to be faint or compact sources versus uh, the FR2 types. Um, essentially, we don't find many red ones like that at all They're in our sample. They're just, uh, they tend to be all blue or virtually all of them blue. Um, so we're starting to discover different characteristics of these. As I said, trying to tease out what is happening over the history of our universe. But first we have to discover these things. And so that's what I'm doing with our three meter telescope and measuring all those red shifts. Um, and so in closing, uh, since I, I hope you've gotten a sort of feel of all the exciting things that are going on at Lick Observatory, um, you can come and visit us. We have public programs, uh, tickets for our public programs for the summer will go on sale later this month. Uh, you can go to lickobservatory.org to find out more information. Our visitor center is open Saturdays and Sundays, noon to 5 p.m. Um, you know, the Shane Gallery, the Visitor's Gallery is open every day, 10 to 5 p.m. And uh, you could also join the Friends of Lick Observatory. And we have an online gift shop in case you can't get up to the mountain during the hours that the gift shop is open. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Gates. Sorry for blinding you. <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Gates, uh, for the excellent lecture. And sorry for blinding you with the lights coming <laughs> on. Uh, so I'm going to stand here in the middle. Uh, I guess this is the mic we're going to use for questions. And most of, you know, partly so that people here will be able to hear you, but also we finally got the live stream working. So thank you to folks. Uh, this is so that the live stream uh, viewers can also hear the questions. So if you have any questions for Dr. Gates, uh, come up here and uh, speak to the mic. <laughs> I had uh, one question. I think I saw one of the slides that referenced to the notion of creating a um, three-dimensional structural map of the galaxy. Uh, did I see that on one of the slides? And if, if so, if that's true. Can you, can you expound on that a bit? So I don't think I had anything on that in my talk. Um, Certainly, Gaia is working, the Gaia telescope is working on measuring proper motions of stars. You can combine that information with radial velocity of the stars and figure out where or how all the stars in our galaxy are moving um, and in a sense mapping out our galaxy that way. Now, that's a project that originally was done with the Carnegie dual astrograph and the, and the Lick refractor back in the day, but now technologies have gotten better. So uh, we can do it for many, many more stars. Does that address your question? Because at least in, in part, there's such a massive disk where it's three dimensional, where you can actually see where some of the positions are. And... Um, I don't know if it exists. It certainly could be programmed, but it's a massive amount of data. Yeah. Um, and, and so measuring, you know, you know, we, we can measure distances to stars with parallax. We can measure how they're moving. Um, we can do all that stuff. But there are, you know, some couple hundred billion stars in our galaxy. So even just doing, making a map of like the nearest million stars is a lot of computational power. I'm sure it can be done. It may have been done. I don't know. Uh, so, so, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Can I get you to come over? I don't think the quarter will go that far. <laughs> Uh, regarding the uh, adaptive mirrors mm -hmm. that you mentioned about, can you explain a bit about the resolution of those individual mirrors and then the focal length, something like that? So you said the mirror is 37 centimeters, right? So for the automated planet finder, the adaptive secondary mirror will probably be about this big, whatever that is in centimeters. Um, but um, the, the mirrors, the Shane Telescope Adaptive Optic System are flat mirrors and thin glass tends to be very flexible. Um, so you can have little pistons, you know, glued or attached to the back that change its shape, push and pull it to change its shape. 
Um, in fact, the adaptive optic system on the Shane actually uses two deformable mirrors. One uses a glass mirror um, that has only, oh, what, 52 actuators, I think, um, but they, they can move a lot. So it does all the coarse focus, astigmatism, coma, corrections. Um, and then we have a second deformable mirror that is a MEMS device, a microelectrical mechanical device. Um, it's a gold coated mirror, actually. It's about an inch square, has a thousand actuators, but they only move plus or minus a couple microns, but they use electrostatic forces. So it can move very, very fast, but it's not very much. So this will, so we call it a woofer tweeter system, sort of analogous to, you know, speakers with low frequency and high frequency, but it's, we're actually moving light by changing the shape of the mirror very quickly. That help? Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> Are you going to be able to build any new domes on the mountain? Or is I know that there was some EPA issues in the past, and I'm just curious if you're rolling telescopes out on parts. So certainly we have sites that are already disturbed that have had buildings removed or destroyed. <laughs> in the SCU wildfire that we can use easily because they're already disturbed sites. Um, sites that have not been used for telescopes before, we do need to do environmental impact assessments and such like that. Um, you know, Mount Hamilton is a pretty unique ecosystem. We have rare plants, we have some uncommon animals. Uh, so we do have to be very careful of that, uh, but there's nothing stopping us from building it. It's just an extra step in the process, but all, all the new telescopes we've been building and installing have all been using already disturbed sites. Hi, uh, so you discussed a lot about highly redshifted quasars. Yeah. And I was wondering that uh, James Webb recently released uh, some pictures of extremely highly redshifted galaxies about like 13 to 15 redshifts. So right. Do you think your data will be able to complement Jaden's Webb's observations or you know, they can build on each other? Yeah, certainly. The wonderful thing about James Webb, you know, space telescopes and ground-based telescopes is they can do very complementary science. James Webb is very particularly designed to look at infrared wavelengths. Um, it's a big mirror, so we can look at super faint stuff. Uh, the problem is there's only one, <laughs> and there are a whole lot of astronomers that want to use it. But the, the data my colleagues are getting from UC Santa Cruz with those extremely high redshift galaxies um, is really helping us understand the very early history of the universe. And, you know, we're, it's looking like those galaxies are remarkably evolved for as high redshift as they are, which is a surprise. Um, so we're looking into that. But, you know, at what point do they turn on and become quasars? When do the massive black holes at their cores become you know, active and so that we see emission from that. So, so there's a whole lot going on and, you know, so yeah, it's just, it's expanding what we can do. And, and we hope that you know, we'll be able to mesh all the data sets and really understand galaxy and quasar evolution from the very earliest times of our universe. Okay, any more questions? Oh, one more in the back there. We'll see if the core will go that far. You might have to get up. When you're looking at the quasar, do you happen to notice a gravitational lensing because of the distance so high and the galaxies in between? So none of the quasars we're looking at are gravitationally lensed. Um, there are a few out there that people study, but the ones we're discovering have not been lensed quasars yet. Um, doesn't mean we won't find any, but all of them so far have been unlensed systems. Any more questions? Oh, I see one more here. So I'm just curious, I mean, you're, you have telescopes set up in one of the most light polluted places in the world and how, you know, how well are you able to mitigate that? So mitigation is a couple different things we do. Uh, one is we try to work with the, the city planning commissions, et cetera, so that they do use appropriate light, lighting to preserve the sky we have. Um, there's been a lot of problems with electronic billboards and cities not wanting to necessarily adopt the standards that the International Dark Sky Association recommends for appropriate lighting. Um, so that's one of the things we do. Uh, the other thing we do is that Lick Observatory has changed our focus. We now focus much more on developing new technologies and new techniques 
uh, because we're a lower altitude facility, which means there's more air and it's easier to think at night when you're trying to figure out new difficult technologies. Um, we're also close to San Jose and the University of California, Berkeley and Santa Cruz. And we also have shops at uh, UCLA. So, so we have this huge brain trust in the reasonably local area to help us build new innovative technologies for doing new science. Um, the other thing we've done is we've changed the, what science we do. We have shifted to doing more infrared work because the infrared sky is not affected by the city lights in San Jose, or we've changed to doing survey work for brighter targets. Like when we look for planets around other stars, we, you know, with the APF, we can only look at one star at a time. We choose the brighter stars in our galaxy or ones that are already known to have planets because of transit uh, discoveries with Kepler and, and other telescopes. Um, you know, discovering supernova explosions, they tend to be pretty bright. So we, you know, we have a robotic telescope discovering that. So we, we have focused our science onto more survey work of brighter targets that are not affected so much by the light pollution. So is light pollution good? No, I mean, we all want less of it, but, uh, but there's plenty of science to be done even with our less than perfect skies. Okay. Uh, uh, is there another one? Okay, uh, excellent. Yeah, go for it. Are, are your high-tech lasers produced here in the Valley? Uh, so the laser we use on the three meter was built at Lawrence Livermore Labs. Um, the one we're installing on the 40 inch telescope is a commercial laser. So I'm not sure where it's actually built. So for the uh, SETI, the optical SETI uh, program, we we're talking about uh, trying to detect um, very, very short pulses uh, of light. Uh, for some reason, uh, probably something you guys are, have already thought about, but there's a, a a uh, telescope in Arizona, I think it is, that's a um, multiple 10 meter mirrors looking at TV gamma ray astronomy. Mm -hmm. And I know they're down in that really, really short right. uh, time uh, wavelength. Can you say anything uh, about like how that technology differs from, from what you're doing with the, with the pan SETI? So, so detecting gamma rays is a really very, very different technology that I am not very familiar with at all. Um, but we do know that gamma ray bursts can be very, very short. Um, but some of them create optical afterglows that can last, you know, seconds to minutes. Uh, so, so that's one of the things that some robotic telescopes, including at Lick Observatory, have looked for is these optical afterglows from gamma ray bursts. Um, will there be some overlap in what SETI or the Pano SETI discovers and the gamma ray bursts? It wouldn't surprise me at all because now we're getting you know, that gamma rays are such high energy uh, compared to the UV to IR that we're looking at with Panoceti that, as I said, there's a possibility for all sorts of discoveries and maybe knowing more about these gamma ray bursts if they do happen to have short, very short uh, optical properties as well. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, one more here. Uh, hi. Uh, so I was just wondering, uh, is the increasing number of uh, satellites in the Earth's orbit causing contamination in the signals? Is it a big problem? And if yes, how, is the, how are the telescopes dealing with that? So it is definitely a problem. It hasn't been a problem so much for LIC with our regular data programs. Where it does affect us with all these extra satellites is when we're using our laser, because we have to shut down, shutter our laser if there's a satellite going through where we happen to be pointing our laser. And we don't want to blind any satellites that could be damaged. Um, so we have a lot of laser shutdowns that are really irritating. In fact, next week I'm going to Vandenberg Space Force Base to have a meeting with some of the people with them that, you know, see what we can do to mitigate the problems. Um, certainly for telescopes like the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, uh, renamed the Vera Rubin Telescope, um, it's going to have a huge problem with all these satellite trails contaminating data. And they have people already working at ways to use software and data processing things to mitigate the problem. Um, you know, it's already a problem. More than half the active satellites in orbit are now from, you know, SpaceX uh, or from uh, Starlink. 
Um, and it's just increasing all the time. And there are other people, other organizations that want to put up mega constellations. It's, it's going to be quite crowded up there. Um, and there are going to definitely be problems. Uh, so astronomers are actively working both in the U.S. and internationally with these satellite, trying to work with the satellite owners and figure out ways to mitigate the problems. But it's, it's a big problem. And, you know, we're working on it. Okay. Any last questions? I want to. I want to let you go at some point here. So, any more questions? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Join me in, in thanking uh, Dr. Hale. So, again, thank you for coming. Uh, please uh, look at our uh, uh, website if you're uh, uh, if you are not that familiar with all our activities. I think we're getting more and more things back uh, in operation post pandemic. Uh, so we have star parties here in town. We have uh, out of town uh, star parties. We have daytime observations with a solar uh, telescope. We have a loaner program. Uh, we have a library over there. We have all kinds of activities. If you want to volunteer to help us with any of those things, that's awesome. If you want to, to take advantage of them, please do. Uh, as you go out the door, stop by the snacks. And then also um, please uh, fill out the, uh, um, the, the sign-in sheet back there. It helps the city to know how many people we have coming out. So we would love to see more names on there. Uh, and then uh, also uh, there's a survey there for uh, quality of the event. So if you can do those two things, that would be awesome. We'd really appreciate it. And again, thank you for coming out. Thank you, Dr. Gates. Very much. That was like a talk. Yeah, I know. Oh my God. God. And I already said I'm checking a bunch of stuff too. Uh huh. Because <laughs> well, I didn't know how much to do what we had. So long, so long, so long. All the fun stuff I can. Uh huh.